One question that a growing number of people seem to be asking is, not just is the Bible the Word of God, but did everything the Bibles wrote, what, what every, every word that they wrote, was it intended on being from God, the Word of God? That is, is it possible that occasionally, every now and then, that the Bible writers made a mistake? That when they spoke about a certain city, or about a certain time, or about a, a certain political ruler, that maybe they made a slight error. More and more people seem to be wondering whether they are Christians or non-Christians. Did the Bible writers, were they perfect in everything that they wrote? Last hour we discussed whether or not the Bible writers made mistakes and we listed several of the ones that people have uh, brought up from time to time about whether how Judas died or how many apostles saw the resurrected Lord. In this series of lectures, and in this particular lecture, we're not only looking at is the Bible the inspired Word of God, but if it is the inspired Word of God, then how are we to view it? The fact is, there seem to be a, a lot more people in, in radio, in the internet, or on the internet, on television, uh, in classrooms, in universities around the world, who are alleging that the Bible is not the Word of God. And it appears that they've been, unfortunately, somewhat effective at teaching this and people believing it. In their book titled, Surveying the Religious Landscape, Trends in U.S. Beliefs, George Gallup Jr. and Michael Lindsay wrote, More Americans are moving toward an interpretation of the Bible as a book of fables, history, and moral precepts. As recently as 1963, two persons in three viewed the Bible as the actual Word of God to be taken literally word for word. Today, only one person in three still holds to that interpretation. Unfortunately, it seems, at least here in America, that through the last, through the last three decades, we'll say, uh, the last four or five decades, people have been moving away from believing more and more in the inspiration of the Bible writers, that everything they wrote was true and factual, to, well, maybe it wasn't and fewer people are believing that. And unfortunately, they're having some kind of impact, a negative impact on students in school, people who are listening to them on the radio or reading their writings on the internet. Unfortunately, we are also having a problem with some people who call themselves Christians denying that the Bible writers, what they wrote, was truth in all that they wrote. There is a book that has been helpful to me and many other people entitled Hard Sayings of the Bible. And it was written by four different men. One of these men, his name is Peter Davids, and he, he's written some very good things. But in this particular book, when he went on to explain whether the Apostle Paul was inerrant, whether he was free from errors in what he wrote, about various matters, in particular in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 8 where the Apostle Paul said that 23,000 Israelites fell or died because of their sexual immorality, he said that Paul got the number wrong. Notice a statement that he made in this book. He said, we here we have a case in which Paul apparently makes a slip of the mind for some reason unless he has special revelation he does not inform us about. But the mental error does not affect the teaching. How often have we heard preachers when written, with written Bibles before them make similar errors of detail that in no way affected their message? In the full swing of dictation, he, that is Paul, cited an example from memory and got a detail wrong. Now this book was written for the purpose of helping people understand that a lot of the passages in Scripture that supposedly are contradictory or troubling or hard to understand, that they're not contradictory and it's just been misunderstandings on our part in 21st century America. But for some reason in this one particular passage, Peter Davids makes the statement time and again that the Apostle Paul, well, he simply made a mistake in giving the number 23,000 in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 8 instead of 24,000 mentioned in Numbers chapter 25 and verse 9, the probable sister passage of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 8. That the Apostle Paul, the inspired Apostle Paul, the biblical writer, made a mistake. This is an 800-page book written for the purpose of helping people to have a better confidence in Scripture and in one particular place, the writer says, well, this Bible writer simply made a mistake. 
Well, if the Apostle Paul made a mistake when writing 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 8, and by the way, this same uh, passage was brought up on that list of alleged factual discrepancies that the young man from West Virginia, who we mentioned in the last lesson in this lecture series, that he, he mentioned this, or on that list it was mentioned that Paul made a mistake. And here is a man who is supposedly a defender of Scripture who says, well, Paul did mess up. Well, if Paul made a mistake here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, then it's possible that Paul made a mistake in writing to the church at Ephesus and that Paul made a mistake in writing to the church at Thessalonica. And not just Paul, but that Peter could very well have made mistakes and, and John and others. And see, if you believe that some of the Bible is true and some of it may not be true, then really you've given up on what we understand as the biblical inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture. And you are alleging exactly what the skeptics allege when they say the Bible writers made mistakes. I was reading a book some time ago titled God's Holy Fire. It's a book written by three different individuals who described Christians who believe in the truthfulness of the Scriptures and all that it says. And they describe Christians who in their attempts, they said, to provide absolute certainty have created a crisis of faith because they are, quote, always feeling a responsibility to provide an answer for every potential discrepancy. They believe that it is okay for Christians to accept the Bible as the Word of God and then be okay with the Bible writers making mistakes. And that if we believe we need to defend what the Bible writers had to say in everything that they wrote, whether it's a matter of history or a matter of geography or a matter of how one becomes a Christian, well, you see, they would probably stop right there. Because people are making a distinction between the spiritual matters of Scripture and then the more general matters of Scripture. And then they went on to say that, well, we're creating a crisis of faith because we feel compelled to answer people's questions when they have questions about what the Bible writers wrote and whether they were accurate in what they wrote. You know, I remember reading in my Bibles, in my Bible, how we are to test everything and hold fast to that which is good. I remember reading where uh, Peter said that we are to sanctify the Lord God in our hearts and always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks us a reason of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. We are not to believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God. Now, how are we supposed to know whether this book is from God? You see, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not reasonable to conclude that we can accept the Bible as the Word of God based upon what we are reading and the evidences in Scripture and then believe that they made mistakes and yet still accept it. The fact is the skeptic is right when he says if there are mistakes in Scripture, then the Bible is not the Word of God. Recently I received a note from a gentleman who asked about one particular alleged Bible discrepancy. And at the end of the note that he sent, he wrote, I'm not a Christian, and these Bible discrepancies are one of the biggest factors of my still not being a Christian. And it may be that there are some here today who are not Christians, and it may be that one of your uh, dilemmas or, or one thing that is holding you back from obeying the Lord is you're not real sure if the book that has the story of Jesus, has the gospel, is the gospel, that you're not for sure if it's factually accurate. Do you think this gentleman who, who wrote this note, do you think it would have sufficed if I had written him back and said, well, it doesn't really matter if there are mistakes in the Bible or not, whether the Bible writers made mistakes or not? No, that would not have sufficed. You see, if the Bible is the Word of God, then the skeptic is right, and we are right when we say, if it is the Word of God, then the Bible writers who were inspired by God, the skeptic would say allegedly, we would say that they were based upon the evidence that we've already noted in this lecture series, then it is supposed to be accurate in all that it says. The gentleman who wrote God's Holy Fire went on to state in the book that Christians merely, quote, assume that God ensured the precise accuracy of the original versions. I asked my two sons, I have three children, my two sons are six and seven, my little girl is about to be four, uh, 
I didn't ask my daughter this, but I asked my two sons, if someone came into the room tonight, to our living room area where we had been sitting watching some cartoons for a little while, and I asked them, I said, if someone came into the room tonight and said they were speaking for God, and that they began to say some things that we could understand, but then they began, began saying things like, well, Abraham Lincoln was the first president of the United States. And New York City is located in Texas. And there is no such place as Alabama. Mexico is not a country. They begin making a lot of geographical and historical mistakes. I asked my sons, and I didn't set them up for this discussion. I just wanted to know what their response would be as a six and seven year old. Would that man be from God? And they said, no. And I said, well, how do you know that? And they said, God doesn't make mistakes. And if that man is speaking on behalf of God, and if God is speaking through them, then they are not going to be making those kinds of mistakes. Is it true that we merely assume that the Bible writers were inerrant in what they wrote? Well, I would like to respond to that by saying, and by looking at how Jesus and the New Testament writers, how they viewed the Old Testament Scriptures. What was their view of the Old Testament Scriptures? You see, how are we supposed to understand, once we come to an understanding that the Bible is the Word of God, well, how much of it is the Word of God? Well, first of all, neither Jesus nor any Bible writer ever called a single passage of Scripture into question. Now, think about that for a moment. The Old Testament Scriptures had been around for hundreds of years, and when Jesus and the Bible writers were upon this earth, the New Testament writers... They never once criticized the Old Testament writings and pointed out various alleged errors. Even the most controversial parts of the Old Testament, they always considered to be the Word of God. Now think about this for a moment. How often today is Genesis chapters 1 and 2 attacked by those who do not believe the Bible to be the Word of God? They say, well, there never was an original couple. There never was an Adam or an Eve. All of that is fictitious. Some people may say there are mistakes. In fact, skeptics have claimed that there's a contradiction in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and that Genesis 2 presents a different order than Genesis 1. Again, that goes back to the purpose of Genesis 2 is not the same purpose as Genesis 1, which was written chronologically. In Genesis chapter 2, you have a more topical account. Well, interestingly, when you look at the New Testament at what Jesus had to say and what the Bible writers wrote, they believed in the accuracy of Genesis 1. Genesis, uh, Jesus quoted in Matthew chapter 19 saying, Have you not read that He who made them at the beginning made them male and female? In His letter to the church at Corinth, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 45, He called Adam the first man. Some say, well, there may have been an Adam and Eve, but there never was this deception of Eve by a serpent. Tell that to the Apostle Paul who in... 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 said that she was deceived by a serpent. You have the Apostle Paul who referred to both Adam and Eve in his first epistle to Timothy, chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. You can go through the Old Testament and many of the stories and accounts that have been criticized over and over and see how the New Testament writers, when they appealed to the Old Testament, when they quoted from it, when they alluded to it, they never said, well, they got most of it right. They considered the inspiration of the Old Testament being thorough. Even the smallest details, even the most controversial parts, we might say, of the Old Testament as being the inspired Word of God. Whether it was Noah and the global flood, Jesus and Peter considered them to be historical characters and the stories that were recorded in the book of Genesis to be true about Noah and the flood, about Lot and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You can look at the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Corinth and see where he really believed that the Israelites crossed through the Red Sea and how they got water from a rock. Now, if there were some things that people may not believe in the Old Testament, it might be that the Israelites got water from a rock. But when the Apostle Paul alluded to that event in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he believed in the truthfulness of it. Even the most disputed parts of Scripture, the New Testament writers believed in the truthfulness of. Some people today laugh at the idea of Jonah ever being uh, in a big fish, swallowed up by a big fish. I've heard members of the church say, well, maybe that was more historical fiction and not really a true story that Jesus alluded to in Matthew 12. Well, the problem with that is Jesus compared His resurrection 
and the three days that he spent in the tomb with the three days and three nights that Jonah spent in the belly of the fish. Not only that, he said that those in Nineveh repented at what? Repented at the preaching of Jonah. How could we say that Jonah wasn't a real person when Jesus said that those in Nineveh repented at his preaching? Jesus and the Bible writers viewed even the most disputed parts of the Old Testament as being the Word of God. You can't see the Old Testament writers who lived after the time of Moses criticizing what Moses wrote. You don't find the New Testament writers criticizing each other's writings. You don't see where the Apostle Paul spoke against Peter, recorded for us in the book of Galatians. You can't find Peter later on getting upset with the Apostle Paul and saying, well, what Paul really wrote, the man who wrote nearly half of the New Testament, what he really wrote wasn't really true in all its accounts. In fact, Peter said the very opposite in 2 Peter 3 when he put Paul's writings on par with the rest of Scriptures. Yes, the New Testament writers believed the Old Testament was Scripture. Even the most disputed parts of it was Scripture. Jesus and the Bible writers believed that even the smallest details, even the smallest details are Scripture. Several times we have Jesus referring back to the Old Testament. In fact, if I understand correctly, Jesus quotes from or alludes to 18 different Old Testament books. Every time he alludes to the Old Testament, he believes it to be the Word of God. And he believes it to be accurate. And then in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus made the statement. He said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Not one jot or one tittle will pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Well, what did he mean by that? Not one Hebrew letter, not the smallest stroke on certain Hebrew letters is going to pass till He fulfills it all. You see, the theme of the Old Testament was the Messiah is coming. Jesus came to fulfill the law and not any of it would be done away. Even the smallest parts until Jesus completed His task. We might compare this with us saying today, the dotting of I's and the crossing of T's. I believe this gives a little insight to us as to how Jesus viewed the writings of the Old Testament and how we, as for an example, are to view the writings of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then we see later when Jesus was confronted by His enemies. After Jesus had made Himself equal with God, saying, I and my Father are one, they began to pick up stones and stone him. And notice in John chapter 10 what Jesus said to his criticizers. He answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent to the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Now we don't have time in this session to go through every passage and look critically at the context of every passage here. What you need to know is that Jesus was being attacked by His criticizers and that Jesus here, for the purpose of this lesson, understand that He quoted from an Old Testament psalm, from Psalm 82 in verse 6. It's a relatively obscure psalm. It's not one that we quote all that often. It's not one that you hear preach from that regularly. But He quoted from Psalm 82 arguing from lesser to greater, saying, Did He not say, did He not call them gods to whom the Word of God came? And I believe in the context there in Psalm 82, He was referring to the judges of His day, using God, the word God in a different sense. Well, Jesus is arguing from lesser to greater, saying, Then why is it a problem with me being called a God? Of course, Jesus was God in the supreme sense, the God in the flesh. But notice that Jesus quotes from one verse... In one psalm, in the book of Psalms, in the entire Old Testament. And then he makes the statement, and you know, Scripture cannot be broken. Why didn't the criticizers of Jesus, why didn't they just say, well, you know, that Old Testament psalm, that wasn't correct. That the writer of that psalm, that he erred in that statement. They didn't say that. 
they knew, and Jesus knew, that the Scripture cannot be broken. And if you believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, we have example after example after example in our Bibles to give us clues as to really to what extent we should believe in that inspiration. Jesus believed even the smallest details of Scripture. The Bible writers believe that even the smallest details of Scripture cannot be broken. We can read when Jesus again was confronted by various enemies, how Jesus challenged the Pharisees to clarify the identity of the Messiah in Matthew 22. He focused on David's use of the single term, Lord. He quoted from the book of Psalms, from one psalm, and he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. He was wanting his enemies of the first century to understand what David said about him. The Lord said to my Lord, and Jesus' point here was that David, even though Jesus is his son, his descendant, that David called him, Jesus, Lord. Jesus put emphasis on one single word. One word. You see, if Jesus could not trust in the truthfulness of one word, in one verse, in one psalm, in the entire Old Testament, then Jesus' point fails. So what is my view of Scripture supposed to be? As Jesus was, if I believe this to be the Word of God, reason declares it must all be the Word of God, or it did not all come from God. And Jesus believed that even the smallest details of it were accurate. You remember when Jesus was on the road, uh, how the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, after Jesus died and resurrected on that day He arose, that Jesus met them on the road to Emmaus, and they were sad, and they began telling Jesus whom they didn't recognize. They began to tell Him about the, the One who came and how He died on the cross, and His tomb is now empty. Jesus then rebuked them, saying, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Jesus didn't say you were to believe in a little bit of the prophets or some of the prophets, but in all of what the prophets have spoken. Jesus then expounded to them, and oh, what that would have been like hearing Jesus expound upon the Old Testament Scriptures, expounded to them in all the Scriptures, the things concerning Himself. Not just some of them, not just part of them. What was Jesus and the Bible writers' view of Scripture? Well, they believed even the smallest details of it were inspired by God. Here's something else to consider. Even the narrational comments Jesus and the Bible writers believed to be God's words. What are, what are narrational comments? Consider Genesis chapter 2 for just a moment. In Genesis chapter 2, we have a quotation from God where God told Adam, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But you recall just a little bit later, we have a verse in Genesis 2 that doesn't say God said this. Genesis 2 and verse 24, we have, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Just a statement by the writer of Genesis chapter 1, Moses. But notice when Jesus quoted from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, He said, Have you not read that He who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall become one flesh. Have you not read that He who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, He who made them said this, God said this. But when you go back to Genesis chapter 2, it doesn't say God said this. You see, it was a statement by the narrator or the human writer that God used to write this. But when Jesus quoted from it, He said, it was God who said it. You see, even the, narration, the narrational excuse me, comments were viewed as being the Word of God. You can go through several examples in our Bibles and in the New Testament to see how when the New Testament writers quoted from the Old Testament, they believed it to be the Word of God. Notice in Psalm 95, the psalm states, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. The writer of Hebrews quoted from Psalm 95. But notice how the writer of Hebrews began this quote. He said, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says. In the book of Psalms, it doesn't say the Holy Spirit says this. How did the New Testament writer view the Old Testament Scriptures as being 
the Word of God. The Holy Spirit says this. And so we have the narrational comments even being considered the Word of God. One more example from Psalm 16 where we read, You will not leave my soul in Sheol, David wrote, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Of course, you remember that Peter quoted this in Acts chapter 2. Paul also quoted it in Acts chapter 13. We read where he said, God has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, who? He doesn't say David says it. He said, God says, in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Jesus and the Bible writers believed in the infallibility of even the most disputed parts of Scripture, of the smallest details of Scripture, even of the narrational comments. They believed in the truthfulness and reliability of the Old Testament, even down to the very tense of a verb and number of a noun. Consider that in Matthew chapter 22 that Jesus, speaking to the Sadducees who came again testing Him, as the Pharisees often had, and Jesus made the comment that we don't always uh, look at in this light, but Jesus made the comment saying, and I'm paraphrasing here, remember what God said to Moses back in Exodus 3? He said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He said, I am that God. Well, you see, that was a very important point for the Sadducees to understand because they denied the resurrection. And Jesus made the point that Moses was told by God hundreds of years after Abraham, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You see, God's point is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob may be dead, but they're still, they still exist in the afterlife, which implies a future resurrection, which I believe was Jesus' point there in Matthew chapter 22. And His whole point hinges on the tense of a verb. And if Jesus could not rely on the tense of a verb, then how shall we say that the Bible is the inspired Word of God? Well, the point is, He did rely upon it, and that is the nature of inspiration in light of or in regard to the extent of inspiration, down to the very tense of a verb? Yes. In John chapter 8, again, as Jesus was confronting some of His enemies, we read that over and over through the Gospel accounts. Jesus mentioned that He had seen Abraham's day, and they said, how have you seen Abraham's day? You're not even 50 years old. Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Again, taking us back, I believe, to Exodus chapters 3 and 4, as Moses stood before God at the burning bush, God telling Moses to go and reveal yourself to Pharaoh as the I am. Reveal God as the I am who I am, or the I am that I am. Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Again, the point is, Jesus placed great emphasis on the reliability of the Old Testament, even down to the tense of a verb. He didn't say before Abraham was, I was. He didn't say before Abraham was, I will be. He said before Abraham was, I am. And then notice in Paul's letter to the churches of Galatia, how he referred back to Genesis 22 and verse 18. And notice the extent to which the Apostle Paul believed in the inspiration of the Bible. You see, we could talk about the inspiration of the Bible all day. And we've had some great lessons, I believe, by Kyle already in this seminar series about evidences for the Bible's inspiration. But to what extent is the Bible inspired? Well, to what extent did Jesus and the Bible writers believe it was inspired? Notice Paul's statement in Galatians chapter 3. He said, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, And to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. He makes a distinction between a singular noun and a plural noun. And he said, the Old Testament writer said, Seeds, oh, excuse me, seed as in one, and not seeds as in many. Many. 
And so Jesus and the Bible writers believed that the entirety of God's Word is truth, that the sum of God's Word is truth. Jesus and the Bible writers never called an Old Testament Scripture into question. They believed even the most casual phrases, we might say, and smallest details of Scripture cannot be broken. They believed that even the narrational comments were God's words. They believed in the trustworthiness of Scripture down to the very tense of a verb and number of a noun. God is truthful. That is right. God is truthful. The Bible records for us that the Spirit is truth, that God's works are truth, that His law is truth, that His commandments are truth, His words are true, His judgments are true. Jesus is the way and the what? And the truth, God does not lie. The writer of Hebrews says it is impossible for him to lie. Paul wrote to Titus, God cannot lie. And so, if God is perfect and the Bible is the Word of God, then the Bible, in its original form as the apostles and prophets wrote Scripture, the Bible must be perfect. But the person who doubts in the this extent to the inspiration of the Bible. They may say, well, but the Bible was written down by humans. And to err is human, thus the Bible could not have been perfect from the beginning. That might sound good. It might sound like a nice argument, but consider the fallacy in this argument. Jesus was a human. You know that. He was born of a woman. He put on flesh, John 1, 1 through 5, verse 14. The Bible also tells us that human beings sin. Thus, what is the conclusion? Jesus sin. Jesus was a human. Human sin. Jesus sin. But wait a minute. Jesus, Paul said, knew no sins. There was no blemish in Christ. He knew no sin. Notice what Norman Geisler and Thomas Howe wrote about this fallacy. They said the mistake is to assume that Jesus is like any other human. Sure, mere human beings sin, but Jesus was not a mere human being. He was a perfect human being. Indeed, Jesus was not only human, but He was also God. Likewise, the Bible is not a mere human book. It is also the Word of God. Like Jesus, it is both divine and human. And just as Jesus was human but did not sin, even so the Bible is a human book but does not err. Both God's living Word, Christ, and His written Word, Scripture, are human but do not err. They are divine and cannot err. There can be no more an error in God's written Word than there was a sin in God's living Word. God cannot err, period. But we quoted earlier from a gentleman who said, Paul made mistakes. Unless he has some special revelation he does not inform us about. Well, of course he has special revelation. And he did inform us about this several times in his writings. Paul claimed that his message came through the revelation of Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 and verse 12. He claimed that his message was by the word of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 15. He wrote that God's message was revealed by the Spirit to His holy apostles and prophets. Paul being one of those. If I stood before you today and I said, God sent me to you and God is speaking through me and then I began to make several mistakes in this message that I'm speaking, you would know right then and there that God didn't send me because if God did and if He was speaking through me, I would not be making mistakes. It's one of the ways that we know someone is not speaking on behalf of God. But someone might say, well, Eric, yes, but, you know, the spiritual matters are correct. You know, God got the spiritual matters correct, and all of those other details do not matter. Well, let me ask you this. Is the matter of Jesus being born of, in Bethlehem of Ephrath, is that a spiritual matter? That's a location, a geographical location. The Bible writers mention that. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Who gets to decide what the spiritual matters are? Well, first of all, there are no statements in Scripture that would lead someone to believe in this manner of interpreting the Bible. That God only got the 
spiritual matters correct. We've already gone through several indications of how Jesus and the Bible writers viewed Scripture. They never led us and they never lead us as we read the Word into an understanding of Scripture where, yes, most of these things are right, but some of them are not all of that accurate. Did God only get the spiritual matters correct? Were it true that only the spiritual sections of the Bible are inerrant or free from error, everyone who reads the text would have the personal responsibility of wading through the biblical documents to decide which matters are spiritual, thus inspired, and which are not, thus uninspired. Did Paul make mistakes of geography? Did he make numerical Mistakes? Did he make other mistakes? Well, who gets to, to decide exactly what matters are spiritual and what matters are not spiritual? Some might say you need to be immersed in order to become a Christian, and that is a biblical doctrine. But is it, is, is it a spiritual doctrine? How many of us know individuals who would say, well, that's not really a, a spiritual teaching, they might say. Well, then how can we know whether it is errorless or not? You see, the Bible is either from God and in Aaron, or the Bible writers wrote, and they wrote errors from time to time, and they made errors from time to time, and they were not from God. Finally, if God only got the spiritual matters correct, then one is forced to conclude that on some occasions God breathed truth, while on other occasions He breathed error. So some want us to believe that God got the most important parts correct, but the parts that supposedly are much more trivial, He didn't get correct. Friends, if God said it, and he made an error, then God didn't say it because God does not lie and he does not make mistakes. And if God could breathe truth all of the time, then why would we think that on the matters that aren't as important as other matters in which he did breathe truth, that he just simply did not breathe truth? When we come to understand that the Bible is the Word of God, and we, when we come to understand that we can answer various alleged alleged discrepancies in Scripture, then we may ask ourselves, well, to what extent should I believe in the inspiration of the Bible? I believe that we have every indication in Scripture that we are to believe in the Bible, even its most disputed parts, down to the minutest details, even the tense of verbs and numbers of nouns as far as what the apostles and prophets wrote and how they got everything right. That, I believe, is a biblical view of Bible inspiration.